Cool. Happy to help however I can. I I feel like my hands are tied in a lot of this stuff, but uh, you know, if there's something I can do to help, I, I want to do that. So.
Good afternoon, everybody. It is 12.03 p.m., and I guess it's time to get started. Um, I'm going to let... Let's see here. I'm just going to get the uh, chat screen up just in case someone has any questions or comments they'd like to share, and uh, we will get started. So... I've been thinking about today's topic for a little while. In fact, been talking, been thinking about it for a long, long time. It's kind of been a part of uh, being a musician, auditioning for things, trying to, um, you know, the ability to be able to perform with a group is important. You know, if we if we live inside the practice room, you know, turtle shell or the practice room cave. Um, we might be making music by ourselves, but you, you got to get out there and play. And for those of you who struggle with performance anxiety, um, maybe you don't audition well, or you've had really bad audition experiences in the past, uh, that have kind of given you, um, fear or nervousness or, you know, whatever this sort of complex might've been created by having bad experiences. The whole point of today's class is to talk about how we can work through that. Uh, one of the big things, and I'll mention it later, is the idea that I want to take as many of the variables that exist in this and turn them into constants as possible. So for those of you that, that remember algebra, obviously there, if there's more than, one, more than one variable in an equation at any given time, they have to provide you with the value of one to get the answer for the other. In order to, if X and Y both exist in the equation, they have to give you the value of one so that you can solve for the other. Now, we can never control everything, but there are things that we can control in an audition setting, and, and almost everything that we can control, really everything that we control, uh, is the stuff that we're responsible for. We can't be responsible for anything that happens once the sounds leave the bell. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is to help you be as fundamentally and fully responsible for everything that comes out of your bell as possible. And it's not just about practicing the individual cuts, excerpts, or etudes. I'm kind of gearing this towards an orchestra or band audition, but I think it can be applied to all region and all state as well. Obviously, there are sometimes fewer materials for those auditions, uh, but the premises, the, the ideas are the same. So I can tweak that a little bit. And I want to say that if you have questions along the way, Please ask them. I have the chat screen open. Um, I'll be able to see those. I may not answer them immediately, but I'll answer them within you know a minute or two of you posting. So if I say something that, that makes a question pop into your head, please ask it. Because the chances are that if you have that question, other people have that question too. And they're just too nervous to ask the question. So don't be so nervous that you won't ask the question that other people already have. Okay. So I'm going to start with a quote, and this is the quote that sort of defines my audition experience. Um, I've had relative levels of success from complete and utter failure being dismissed after the first excerpt that I played to winning the audition. So, um, and everything in between. Uh, so this is my experience, and this is the quote that sort of, that I remember most directly with this. Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. It's from Abraham Lincoln. The idea that he spends two thirds of the time preparing the axe, which is a, it's a tool to magnify or multiply your strength. A lumberjack with a dull knife or with a dull blade, a dull axe, uh, isn't going to get much done. It comes down to good technique. It comes down to pre well-prepared materials and tools. And then the job becomes much smoother. You can either spend six full hours whacking away at the tree with a dull axe, or you can sharpen the blade, which takes time, and it makes the actual physical exertion much easier. So here we go. Um, so I think that in terms of the sharpening the axe, the biggest threat that we have to our to ourselves when we're preparing for an audition of any type is scatterbrainedness not having singularity of focus, not being able to walk in, get the list of excerpts or the list of cuts and go, I can play this and then I can immediately transition into this style for this and I can immediately transition into this style for this and I can go down the page and I can go down the page and I'm feeling and sounding as comfortable as possible in each cut that comes along. 
we worry about the the group that we're trying to audition for, what they want to hear, and all of those things that are outside of our control. What we can control is, are we playing with the right style? Are we playing the right notes at the right time and in tune with a great sound? Um, are we stylistically appropriate? All of those things are things we can control. So before we get to any of that, though, the first step, and I have cool overlays today, which I'm going to add in here. Step one, you need to get organized. First and foremost, collect and bind the music. You can either use a comb binder or a three ring binder. The idea here is, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, our band directors would give us a packet with the all region materials, like the beginning of the school year. They would have the, the comments and the etudes copied, stapled. And then I always needed the page that I couldn't find because that staple would wear out by the middle of September. And then I'm missing the back page and I have, lose all my markings and it's just bad news. So Take some time at the beginning to create a binder or a comb bound book of your excerpts with some blank pages as well for comments. And if you have the extra money and time, make a second copy for your teacher, for anyone that's going to listen to you so they can sit sort of out in an audience and hear you from the other side of the bell and have your materials right there so that you're not scrambling to find your part for Bolero or your part for the for Rolling Thunder. It's all together. And it seems like a very simple thing, but I can't tell you the number of people who come in preparing for an audition to play for me. And they have like this stack of papers that looks like, I don't know, it's, it's like papyrus because everything's been like rolled up and crumpled and then flattened. And, you know, it's just keep it organized. And then the other part of getting organized is finding recordings and scores for as much of the music as you can. Now, sometimes if it's a, a university band's audition, you can probably ask someone in the music library, uh, maybe even ask the director of bands or if it's an orchestra audition, the director of orchestra or the orchestra librarian. If there's a copy of the score available, you can also look at mslp.org, org, I-M-S-L-P, the International Score Music, I-S, M-S-L-P, I-M-S-L-P, International Music Score Library Project. Uh, you can give a donation there and then you have access to any score that's in the public domain. Uh, this is great for things like Beethoven symphonies and Brahms, older stuff. But if you can get a copy of the score from your library or you can buy them used on Amazon for cheap, the Dover scores are great study scores. You want to have the score because you want to know what's going on around you as much as you know what's going on in your part. And then the other part is to start collecting recordings. Now, this is easier than ever. You have access to more of it right on your phone than I did as a student. And this is not a lecture about back in my day. This is just a, a statement of fact. You have more access to recordings of this music than ever before. You want to make sure that you have good, solid recordings. Recordings that... The recordings, what they provide that even the score doesn't always provide is there's traditional things that happen in performance practice that aren't always written in the part. Maybe there's a traditional place where there's always a slowdown or an accelerando. And you need to know that because if you hear that in five recordings and it's not marked in the part, then you should probably do that when you're playing your excerpt because it shows that you're aware and informed of what's going on in the music. And you know the music well enough to know that traditionally there's a slowdown there. Uh, I think that those things are important. Sometimes they're very subtle and very nuanced. But if you have access to both the score, the visual ability to know what's happening in the clarinets, and what's happening in the bassoon, what's happening in the tuba, what's happening in the percussion, immediately before you come in, immediately after you're done playing and while you're playing, it gives you something to latch onto. It gives you context and how your part fits in. And then through the recordings, you're learning the sort of oral tradition in a way. You're learning the, the things that are passed down through performance practice that aren't necessarily on the page. So organize your music into in some sort of binded form and have playlists and scores that you can study because you're going to spend time on that, especially early on, so that you can learn how your part fits in. Now, one of the ways that you can, you can organize your music after you have it bound is to collect it into three categories. You have the category of music that you know, which is music that you've ever either performed or if you listen to it so much that you can sing along with the whole thing, conduct with it. You just know it inside and out. 
I knew Mahler's Second Symphony very, very well before I ever played it. Uh, before I ever even practiced it, I knew it really well. And that meant that when the excerpt came, I had some context. Now, I think that there's a slippery slope and that some people can start to learn those things by ear. And you can debate the relative merit of learning it by ear, but you know the bigger piece that it comes from and you know the role that the trombone part plays in that piece or the trumpet part or whatever instrument you might be playing. Then there's music that you're acquainted with. This is something that you may have heard a couple of times. Or you know music by the composer, you know other music. Like if you know Mahler 2, then Mahler 3, 4, and 5, really 1 through 5, the, 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 knowing one kind of informs some of the other. So you're acquainted with the composer, you're acquainted with their compositional language, your the, their, their way that they write music. Um, you're familiar with music from the style period, but not necessarily that piece. You may have heard it before a couple of times, but you, you couldn't necessarily pick it out of a lineup exactly. That's music that you're acquainted with. And then there's the music you don't know at all. Someone could play it for you. You could turn on the radio to, to, N, to NPR or, or whatever, and, and they have it on uh, public radio, and you have no idea what the music is, and you couldn't possibly do a score ID on it. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of people take this music that they're acquainted with, and they assume that that means that they know it. Oh, yeah, I know it. Do you know it? Do you really know it? And you have to ask yourself, you know, do you really know it? So that's the second step. And I forgot to put it up here. That's divide and conquer. You're breaking down these the stack of excerpts, the list, the auditioning list, into those three categories. Then the third step. You want to plan your work. This is obviously pretty standard. But I think it's important that you start to create a practice plan and a listening plan and a score study plan. And you can do the score study and listening together. I think that when you're first getting going, I think getting started is important. Getting started is almost more important with the listening than how you get started. It doesn't necessarily need mean that you need to get into a quiet room, into a small cloistered space where you're just going to listen to the music on repeat with a score in hand and you're pouring over it with pencil markings and all that. I think that in the immediate hustle and bustle of getting excited about doing an audition, you just need to listen. You need to listen a lot. You need to listen while you're washing dishes. You need to listen while you're changing the oil in your car. You need to listen while you're doing menial tasks because you're, you're, you're wanting to sort of marinate or steep yourself in this music and you, you start to absorb it. There is going to be time for a specific score study, but from the beginning, one of the ways that I get excited about the music is by just listening to it on repeat. I make a playlist of everything that's on the audition and I just let it roll through. You're getting familiar by osmosis. The detailed work can happen later, but starting now on the early end, just start listening to the music. Get comfortable with it. And the next step here you have to work the plan. You plan the work and then you work the plan. Now, I, this I, want, I have a caveat here about my own personal experience with uh, when I won my chair in Arkansas Symphony. I spent about half of my my practice time for this audition at a, working out of Arben, Schlossberg, and the Charlie Vernon book. These were all three sort of fundamental-based books. They were all wonderful books, but the Charlie Vernon book in particular was great. It's a second trombone audition. I have never been known for having a, a, the world's best low register, but I knew that if I wanted to have a fighting chance on this thing, that I needed to have a system that allowed me to play in that register regularly in a lyrical way to connect it with the rest of my playing. And that book was absolutely invaluable. Some of the exercises in the first part of that book, not to mention his excerpt studies in the end that takes you through multiple keys and multiple articulations and ways to sort of shed some of the hardest excerpts that we have. That book is invaluable. Absolutely invaluable. These excerpts, they never change. I think it was John Swallow that said that he got a, a postcard from a friend like 50 years later after the friend had asked him to write down like the excerpts he should know. And for the most part, they've always been what they've always been. 
Bolero, the trombone solo is never going to change. The Mahler three solo is never going to change. But you are a constantly evolving and changing entity. You're getting older. You're becoming more musically mature. There's things about your playing that are changing every day. And as you're a student and you're continuing to improve, it could be exponential in some ways. And so you have to work on you, the things that make up you as a musician, because that's ever evolving. And your perception and your execution of the excerpts may change, but the music itself is pretty static. It's going to stay the same. So you have to make sure that you're spending plenty of time in your work on the fundamentals to make you play the trombone well. I, if you play the fundamentals well, then you can play the excerpts or you have a fighting chance of playing the excerpts. If you only crush the excerpts over and over, um, that's not always the most balanced approach. It's not the most balanced diet in terms of your practice. So don't forsake your fundamental work for your excerpt work. Now, speaking about the excerpts specifically, we talked about breaking the music down into those three columns. We're going to call column A the music that you know. If you've played it before, if you're very, very, very familiar with it, if you've studied it, that's column A. Column B is the one where you are acquainted with. And column C is, sorry, (laughs) column C is the one that you're not aware of, not familiar with at all. You want to practice the material in a way that everything from the C column eventually goes to the B column. You go from not knowing it to be acquainted And then you're going from it being acquainted to the A column where you know it. Eventually the goal is to shrink down those three columns into two and into one so that you are completely aware of everything that's on that audition list. Leave no stones unturned. Uh, I'm not telling you that it needs to happen in the course of a week or two weeks. The, The time frame is based on how much time you have between now and the actual audition. And you have to gauge that a little bit and you learn a little bit of that through experience, but you should be aiming to never have to say, oh, I hope they don't pick that excerpt. I hope they don't pick that cut. I hope they don't pick that etude. I hope they don't pick that scale. What if instead you were so thorough in your preparation that you could say confidently when you walk in the room, bring it on, whatever you want me to play, bring it on. I can play anything that you put in front of me that I've been asked to prepare. What would that do to your overall anxiety level walking into that audition? What would it do to your psyche? What would it do to how you feel about yourself as a musician? And how many musicians link up or marry or connect how they feel as a musician with how they feel as a person? How personally empowered would you feel if all 48 of your scales absolutely rock solid. You didn't have to worry about the law of averages about whether they will or won't ask for something. Just a thought. So once you get everything to column A, once everything has moved over to all music that you know well, you've studied the score, you've listened to the recordings ad nauseum, and you've listened to multiple recordings of each piece. And you start to really get a a framework for how these things are um, built and how your part fits in. I don't think that the goal, once you're at everything in column A, uh, I don't think the goal is to play everything on the list every day. But it's a good idea to break it down into halves or thirds. There's going to be things that you don't need to look at every day. But you do need to be on a rotational basis so you don't get into a rut uh, where you're you, you know, you want to, you don't want to neglect the ones that you feel like you have under your, under your belt either. You want to make sure that you're, you're, you're touching all of them regularly. One of the ways that you can do that, um, putting it into a randomizer, um, and, and so that you're, you're not putting any of your bias into picking, um, the ones to work on. You're wanting to do everything you can to, to just make sure that you're thorough but consistent and and fair about the distribution of your work. And then over time, we want to start transitioning from woodshed practicing to performing. And I honestly think that a really good audition round is a performance. A really good audition round conjures up in the listener's ear the things that are going on around the excerpt that they're hearing. 
if you're conveying everything with the proper style, you're, you're, you're careful to, to, to mark all the markings on the page and know what every term means. And you're able to bring all of that to your interpretation. Then the musician that's listening to you can conjure up those sounds around what you're playing. I know that because of having been on a panel, it's happened to me as well. And it's very clear. You can tell when someone has done that work and when they haven't. And when you're a compelled, a compelling musician, when you're playing in a compelling way, I think that people tend to give you the benefit of the doubt if you chip a note. I'm not telling you that, that necessarily you should be aiming to chip notes, but chip notes happen, right? Mistakes happen. But man, I can really forgive some stuff if the intent is very strong and it's clear that the person is well prepared. If they really know what they're what they've what they've prepared. That makes a big difference. And so I think that there's some tips that you can that you can bring to this that are going to help you. And so I want to share a few of those here. As far, as far as transitioning from practice to performance, you want to stack the get the deck against your favor. If you have, let's say that you're you're a high note player, you're you're good in the upper register, so you, your boleros and your your things of that nature tend to be fine. But you are no good at soft low playing like Sanson organ symphony or um, anything else that might be sort of low and slow and and, and connected. Uh, you need to be playing those things back to back as regularly as possible. You need to be getting in the mindset of being able to go from one style to the next. And this is where your score study and your listening really makes a difference because the context is everything and being able to switch style comes from your memory banks. You can write a few things on the excerpt. That's fine on the top of the page. That's fine if you need a buzzword to get you to get you in the mindset. But the reality is that these are things that if I say Bolero, Mahler three, Sansa, Rossini, Gazzaladra, you should be able to shift between those fairly quickly if you're prepared. So, you know, you can throw those numbers, you assign a number to each excerpt, throw those numbers into a randomizer app, and then play whatever five are pulled out of that for that time and be able to play them down. The goal here is to be able to play them down. Ice cold. Be able to just do it. Hit your tempos, you know, hit your style, all of the things that are related to it. Give yourself 10 or 15 seconds between, you know, because you're going to have that time because you're going to finish playing the first cut. They're going to write something down. You're going to have a little bit of time. It's not like you finish one piece, you get four counts of rest, and then you go to the next excerpt. You're going to have a little bit of time where they're writing things down, maybe writing down a score. So you want to emulate as much as you can in the practice room. And then I mentioned it. I've mentioned it several times here. It's because it's super important. The fastest way to change these gears between excerpts is through your score study and recording study. It's super, super, super important that you do that. I did not do that as a younger student with some of my auditions. And I, I frankly, you know, looking back on it, you could say that I, I don't want to say that I wasted my money, but I could have had a much better experience if I had done that work, if I had done that preparation. And I really... You know, it's, I look back on it and I, it's fine because it all has worked out and I, I'm doing okay. But if I had been, if I had spent more time sharpening the ax in that way, I think I would have had better audition experiences earlier on and I would have gotten further along sooner. It's not so much about whether you have immediate success. It's about learning how to, how to maximize your, your learning potential through the experience of auditioning. And you so see, you want to pull everything you can out of this experience as possible. And this score study and, 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 and recording study is super important for that. Knowing what happens immediately before you play. I'm thinking about held and Laban before we have the da da di da before that, we know there's a snare drum that's happening, right? We know that there's certain things in the music, um, before the Brahms one corral, there's solos that happen before. There's things that happen immediately after. 
all those context clues are super important. Am I a soloist? Am I part of a smaller chamber ensemble within the group? Um, you know, all that stuff matters. The Sansaw Organ Symphony, the piece that the part that's, you know, the big solo, it's not a solo at all. You're part of a chamber group. And there's a unique color of those instruments that are combined. And I think knowing that whether you're the lowest, the middle, or the highest voice in a chamber group within the orchestra affects how I'm going to play that part. And then the third tip, which may be the best tip that I have gotten through my years of doing this. And incidentally, I want to I want to say that this is most of these ideas are not my own. I am borrowing them from people who are who have way more experience than I do, namely many of my teachers and people who have helped me along the way. Um, but you need to journal after the audition as soon as you're done. As soon as you're done. You can have time to lament over things with people after the fact, but you need to go grab a pencil, a paper, your phone, something to dictate to yourself, good and bad, the experience that you had that day. And maybe even journaling in your preparation time, the month or two leading up, if you have that much time. You want to journal so that you're building your playbook, the same way that a football team has a, has a playbook of things that they've been working on that they can execute. They practice it, and then they execute it in, on game day, and it becomes automatic. If you know that on, on audition days you, should, you get jittery if you have too much caffeine, you write that down, and then you know in the future on audition day I'm not going to load up on caffeine. You know, if you know that, man, I really wish that I had not eaten a big breakfast. Maybe you're, you're a person that doesn't need to eat a big breakfast. You know, you can, you can set yourself up and start to know what you need. This is how the older musicians that you know, know these things. It's through their experiences. And you can start to replicate that for yourself. So if something goes well, you do it again. And if something doesn't go well, you don't do that again. It seems like it's simple if I'm explaining it right now, but... You know, we get so wrapped up in all the things that we should be doing that we we sometimes neglect to pay attention to the things that we did and how it affected everything else that we're doing. And all these things are interconnected. So, you know, not just journaling about your behavioral things and the things that set you up, but what in the audition went well? What went poorly? Did you nail everything or did, did the same old problems creep in? Did you rush through that dotted eight sixteenth passage? that you always rush through in the practice room? Did it show up on, on game day and, and could present itself as a problem? Or was it clear to you that the work that you've put in for this audition really made a difference this time? And that problem that you had before with splitting that particular note or, or being out of tune on those arpeggios, you know, is it better? And then you can go back and look through your journal to see, okay, so this time these the, the tuning on these arpeggios was better. And I used this exercise out of the Schlossberg book and these exercises out of the Arben book, and it made them better. So now I know that the next time around, I'm going to do more of that. It, like I said, it may seem like a simple thing, but I don't know how many people actually do it. And I know that when I started doing it, my average went up in, in terms of success. Not just in orchestra auditions, but ensemble auditions at, at universities that I went to when I was in school. Um it makes a difference. It really does make a difference. Um, let's see here. And I have a, a couple of final thoughts here that I want to share. Uh, but this is the big one. So I'm going to make clear these other ones out here. They'll be on the video. But I'm going to clear them out to make some space. The final thought. No audition is a waste of your time. It can be easy to feel like, particularly right now, that buying a plane ticket, getting a hotel room, paying for a lessons or two with, with people that you trust that are going to listen to you play, that it's an expensive outlay. And why am I investing this money if there's no chance that I can win the audition? Well, I think that if that's your mindset, then that's what's going to happen. And if you set yourself up from the beginning to assume that you're not going to win, then there's no way that you can give it your absolute best shot. Now, I'm not saying that you convince yourself that you're going to win. And then, you know, it's a delicate, it's a delicate strike uh, balance that you have to strike here. But I think that if, 
you can gain insight from the experience of the audition, then no audition is a waste. And the best thing that you're going to take away from the audition experience is the preparation time. I mean, the actual audition day is a fraction of a percent of the time that you spent on this material. It's, it's only that one run through. The true insight that you're gaining from this is what you've done over the previous three, four, five weeks, if you have that long. If it's a university ensemble audition, you might have two weeks. You do these same things, you just do them in an abbreviated fashion. But if you don't get the chair that you wanted, if you don't win the audition or you, you don't place or you know, that person beat me and they shouldn't beat me because I'm a better player, okay, I mean... You can feel that way. You can have that, that pity party for now. But at some point, you have to get back up. You have to get back up and you have to try again. You have to be willing to lose now in order to win later. Because I think that we have to sometimes reframe what winning actually is. If you only ever succeed, if you never fail in these ventures... I don't know if you're going to learn as much as if you fail and you fail and you fail and you fail, you fail up, you find a way to, to take something away from the experience that you can only get from the experience itself. It's so easy to wait until you're ready. I, in many ways I waited until I was ready for, for solo competitions. And I don't think I taped for um, American trombone workshop until I was, almost in my mid twenties. Now my undergraduate experience was a train wreck. So uh, my mid twenties, I was finishing up a bachelor's degree, but the fact was I should have been taping for those things when I was 18, 17, not because the, the allure of winning so much, but if I had been taping when I was 18 or 19, I would understand the process so much better. And it would have been easier for me later on when I was competitive you know, I mean, the, the first time I taped for American Trombone Workshop, I advanced to the live round in D.C. And I was against Jim Albrecht and Jeremy Wilson. The first time out of the gate, you know, Southeast Texas boy flying to D.C. for the first time with my brand new suit from Men's Warehouse. And I'm going up there and I've never actually done this before. And I'm up against these two monsters and not monsters of people. They're, they're sweethearts of people, but monster players. You know, if I had been doing it, I would have gained valuable insight that would have made my experiences later different. And so what I'm passing on to you today is this idea that, you know, these are things that I've learned from talking to people, from from going to master classes, from taking lessons, from visiting with them about their own experiences. Uh, and it, it, I'm trying to share this so that you don't have to go through some of the same heartbreak you're going to have your own heartbreak related to this. Everybody gets frustrated and disillusioned. Uh, but I can't tell you the number of musicians that I know that have gone from disillusionment to audition success. And I'm not saying that they've done it by doing my list of things, but they've done it because they found the system that works for them. And there may be individual things in the system that, that don't work for you. And that's okay. But I would tell you that the spirit in which all of these things that I've presented today, they should help you. They should make a difference. So let me ask you this question. Think about your last audition, the last time that you auditioned for an ensemble. And it didn't go as well as you wanted. And you were frustrated. It is easy it is easy, easy, easy to say the auditions rigged or they already knew who they wanted or uh, that was decided before they even posted the list. Yeah, and it might be. But you can do everything in your power so that you can make that a harder decision for them. And if you know that it was close, if you got second and the other person got first and, and you're being told that it was very close, then you were this close and just a little bit more work in some areas might've made the difference. 
And I don't believe that it's a matter of cramming before the audition more. I think it's about how we use the downtime effectively. It's the how we use the, the winter break in December. It's how we use the spring break. It's how we use the fall break. And it's definitely how we use the summer. Now, am I saying that you need to sit inside the house all day long, all summer, and do nothing but practice? No. You need to be balanced. You need to have a life. You probably need to have a job and make some money over the summer. But the people who put the horn in the case in May or June and don't get it out until two weeks before the audition are never going to fare as well as the people who are playing regularly. Now, I don't know if you can see here, but I have my trombone on a trombone stand in my office. Now, I'm teaching a lot during this weird COVID time. But the single biggest thing that helps me when I'm not motivated is to have the trombone out. My friend is sitting there and he's he's sort of like, you know, he's not saying anything, but he's letting me know that he's there. And those times that I practice when I don't need to practice, when I don't have anything immediately pressing, those are the times when I can focus on all the stuff that I know I need to be doing that isn't urgent, but it's important. The long tones, the lip slurs, the scale work, the arpeggios, the linking registers, all the fundamental things that I was working on in the audition that ultimately I believe had the biggest impact on my ability to win that audition. My excerpt list, I don't have my first round here, but I have it framed in my office because it was the absolute worst first round that anyone could have posted for me. It had all of my weakest things back to back. But, you know, it was the first time in my experience where I could say, okay, I've already done that. I've done this list. This list has come up on my randomizer before. These five or these six. So I felt like I was doing something again rather than doing something absolutely for the first time. And it made all the difference in the world when I walked out on that stage to play. Because I was behind a curtain. I couldn't see the audition committee. And I just went out there and I, I replicated something that I'd already done in the practice room. And I, I can't tell you how great it felt to go outside and get some fresh air after that, knowing that I had left no stone unturned. And I, I'm not trying to baby face myself and say that I'm the greatest, you know, auditioner in the world. I'm far from it. There are people out there with tre- tremendously more experience than me. But this has been my experience, and I want to share that with you. I want to give you the opportunity to learn from my experience and be encouraged to try these things because they can make a difference. So... Um, if we have any questions, I don't know who all is watching, but, uh, if we have any questions or any things that you'd like me to discuss, we have a couple minutes here. So hop on the chat and, uh, if you have any thoughts, you know, maybe I can field a specific question or, or something that can be of help to you. I don't know. As I pop the top of my Coke Zero. Well, I guess there aren't any questions. That's kind of disappointing. But maybe I was just so thorough in my in my explanation that everything was covered. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all I have for today. I hope that you got something from this. Um, I'm going to post this one online, uh, probably on the YouTube channel. Oh, here we go. Got one from Andy. But I'm going to post this online for people who weren't able to actually uh, be here. But I think there's some good stuff in here that I want to be able to share. Uh, Let's see here. The general thing has helped me so much for DMA auditions. My first audition was a train wreck, and using that data helped me learn, helped me earn the gig the following week. Less of a question, more of a thank you. Yeah, man. Hey, um, it's anything that you can that you can take away from the experience is going to be a good thing. I. I I firmly believe that. And uh, again, I don't think that everyone has to do the exact same thing, but these are tried and true methods. These are things that I picked up from people like Toby Oft and Joe Alessi and my teachers, Brent Phillips, uh, John Whitaker, Jimmy Clark. These are all people who have done this at a high level and were able to give me some invaluable advice along the way. 
So I don't claim it to be all my own. <laughs> I just wanted to disseminate some of the things that I'd heard and put them all in one place and share them with all of you. So, all right. Well, I am going to sign off for now, but I hope everyone is, is well. You're healthy and your families are healthy and the people that you care about are healthy and um, that you're getting through everything as best you can. Um, as always, I am here if you need me and uh, I hope to hear from you soon. Take care.